Hello, and welcome back to the Thinking Progressive Podcast. I'm your host, Ron Rivers, and in this episode, we're going to be exploring the American Constitution from three different perspectives. The first perspective is a brief critique of strict adherence to our existing Constitution. The central premise behind the argument is that everyone alive today uh, has essentially inherited this document as a part of their identity. It, it's an artifact of the past, but it binds our hands in the present. And from that perspective, strict adherence to the document is unjust. Uh, and it's an unjust action towards the majority of Americans. The second argument we'll make in the, in the perspective we'll explore is the concept of evolving constitutions. It's a recognition that our Constitution was designed to grow and change over time and that today, uh, over 241 years since its inception, the original Constitution holds too much conservative power over our lives. Uh, by embracing evolving constitutions, we can explore new ways of living and accelerate the advancement of collective society. The third perspective kind of piggybacks off the second which is examining generational constitutions. It's an exploration of how we might alter the constitution once we embrace that the document should be altered. Um, I'll argue that this process gives agency, uh, more agency really, to every human being in the United States and allows future generations more of a voice in the shaping of society. The basis for all of today's discussion stems from three separate essays I wrote in 2018 updating and adding to them where I saw fit for today's discussion. Thank you again for listening to the Thinking Progressive podcast. In 1789, Thomas Jefferson wrote a letter to James Madison that is recorded in, in what we now know as the Federalist Papers. Um, and in this specific letter, he said, I set out on this ground, which I suppose to be self-evident, that the earth belongs in usufruct to the living that the dead have neither powers nor rights over it. We seem not to have perceived that by the law of nature, one generation is to another as one independent nation to another. Modern American society has seen a sharp divide in the legal interpretations of the United States Constitution. Uh, issues ranging from communication, women's rights, firearms, racial and class inequity, and the relation of corporate finance and politics were decided in the Supreme Court by examining the issues being litigated against our founding document. Today, we have a very politicized Supreme Court, thanks to the Trump administration, which American society hasn't really begun to see the impact of just yet. There is no doubt that the rights and protections granted by the Constitution were a revolutionary reimagining of what societies could be. But are we doing justice to our society by strictly observing a document created in 1787 by a collection of wealthy landed elites? Founder Thomas Jefferson was evident with his intention that constitutional rigidity created a systemic issue of unfairness towards future generations. In a letter to John Carthright, he wrote, Can one generation bind another and all others in succession forever? I think not. The Creator has made the earth for living, but not the dead. Rights and powers can only belong to persons, not to things, not to a mere matter unendowed with will. As an original author, Jefferson understood the inherent dilemma and significant negative ramifications of having each new generation bound to the laws, practice, and culture of their ancestors. Now, however, many relevant and recent legislative issues subjected current generations to the writings of the founders. So in other words, many of the laws that are being decided today still reflect on these original documents as a source of guidance. Uh, and now given the stricter Supreme Court with a more conservative leaning, um, that's likely to happen more often. The best example of, of a ruling like this is one that permeates all aspects of our political and social life today in 2019, and that is campaign financing. Despite data showing clear majorities in both political parties' desire for limits on campaign spending, the Supreme Court used the First Amendment to justify unrestricted political funding for for-profit corporations. Despite data showing clear majorities in both parties, for desiring for limits on campaign spending, the Supreme Court used the First Amendment to justify unrestricted political funding 
uh, by for-profit corporations. Uh, according to publicintegrity.org, uh, and I quote, the ruling declare that spending is speech and is therefore protected by the Constitution, end quote. The results of this have led to more than 20% of all campaign finance funding originating from private organizations which are not obligated to disclose their donations. Citizens United is something we were all subjected to despite majority opposition, and many of us would imagine that in a legal challenge, the potential negative ramifications of such a decision would have been weighted above strict adherence to a centuries-old document. It's unlikely that the Founding Fathers could have conceived of the level of social and political connectivity that we existed within today, and how significant private investment could skew public perception, right, as we've seen from 2016. Citizens United is an example of an injustice laid upon the American people based on the writings of individuals who have been dead for over 198 years. In a letter to H. Tompkinson, or you know, aka Samuel Kirchevel, on July 12, 1816, Jefferson wrote, I am certainly not an advocate for frequent and untried changes in laws and constitutions, but I know also that laws and institutions must go hand in hand with the progress of the human mind. As that becomes more developed, more enlightened, as new discoveries are made, new truths disclosed, and manners and opinions change with the change of circumstances, institutions must advance also and keep pace with the times. This is from Thomas Jefferson over 200 years ago. I mean, you can recognize the enlightenment in that statement. And while the founding fathers of the United States Constitution were revolutionary thinkers of their time, like Jefferson, it is illogical to tie the ultimate legal precedence to the strict and legal interpretation of their document. The founding fathers understood this, but many in our modern society do not. By allowing conservative legal judgments based on literal interpretations of the Constitution, we're restricting society, that's you and I and everyone else, uh, of both present and future to be subject of the whims of the dead. That is an injustice that will need to be rectified through the reformation of our legal structures to better prepare Americans for the coming technology-driven transition. The next significant shift in political thinking will occur when candidates and citizens understand that the existing social, economic, and political structures are not natural laws. They don't bind us to a fate outside of our control. They're totally within our making. Our present legal structure stems from our Constitution, the document that was a profound reimagining of social, economic, and political structures. A moment ago, I, I argued that a strict literal interpretation of the document uh, is an unjust action against citizens today in 2019. Um, and really the underlying theme is that if we view the Constitution as a social technology, we can begin to imagine alternatives that would better empower the collective citizenry of today. Thomas Jefferson went so far as to recommend that the Constitution be rewritten every 19 years, the laws expire, and that society had to re-vote on them. That was actually his intention. Uh, he wrote that in a letter to James Madison. Jefferson gives us a really evident starting point to kind of how we might imagine this institutional reformation. We, and when I say we, I mean, you know, the, the collective citizenry through the government could facilitate a public constitutional convention, forming a cooperative chain of essentially communication, progressing from the municipalities at the very local level to the state uh, level and, and then to the federal level. Public feedback could be provided through a very secure digital channel, let's say a, a deeply encrypted one-way communication channel, or you know, via traditional paper ballot methods as well to prevent interference. When it came time to vote on the document, we could make a new voting day, declare it a national holiday, and require every citizen by law to participate in the voting, uh, or else face you know, fiscal penalties, um, like they do in over 31 other democratic countries. When we discuss these kind of institutional reforms, and we, we talk about deepening democracy through public voting, which um, if you've been listening to the Thinking Progressive podcast, you know I'm a big fan of and a big advocate of, we have to develop methods of communication and transfer of data and information uh, in, in multiple formats. And, and that's really critical because today we live in a society where we have multiple generations, generations that a hundred years ago, you know, we would have two generations for the most part dead already uh, just because of natural causes who have through modern medicine been alive. And, and now it's given us this huge gap in the way we communicate 
uh, and, and the way we comprehend and, and you know, kind of process information. So it's important that as we think about reforming society, central to all of these reforms is ensuring that there is a publicly owned, centralized, not for profit, right? It can't be Facebook or anything like that. Um, database of facts and information about these new policies, about the alternatives that we're discussing, put forth in a variety of formats. So there could be video, it could be essays, it could be debates, it could be lectures, it could be podcasts, whatever is most convenient. The idea is we want to take the, the information and present it in as many formats as possible so that anyone who is interested can digest the information in a manner that is most comfortable to them. Proposed changes would be required to be submitted in a detailed analysis, right? It's, we're not playing politics with this. This is policy. Uh, we want it to be concise, but an accurate summary in a video format as well. Like I mentioned, um, the public could hold discussions about the proposed resolutions via the online platform. So we could you know, imagine a chat functionality or a moderated forum uh, to ensure accuracy and factualness, allowing for public questions and, and professional responses. You know, one great example I love is a forum on Reddit called uh, r slash neutral politics, which I think they have really great forum moderation. Um, not everyone has that strong a moderation throughout the internet. So uh, that's a really great example. Now, if we wanted to kind of ease into this process of evolving the constitution and constantly making a change, we could initially constrain the number of potential changes for the initial vote. And, and you know, so essentially give it a limit. Given the generational gaps in society today, which you know are in turn are essentially consciousness differentials, there are different forms of existing, different forms of viewing the world. We, we probably want to ease into this process, right? I'm not recommending a wholesale substitution of the Constitution. Uh, well, that's not true. I am recommending that, but I think in in the long term process of actually making this a reality uh, and forming a public consensus around it we would build out this kind of implementation, this piecemeal rollout, kind of attacking one or two things at a time to kind of debate. And hey, we may decide that we want to keep it as is, or we may decide that we want to break it apart uh, and, and kind of allow it to be more customization and, and ideally transferring some things to states' rights and making some things federal. Of course, with any technology, we could devise a system that filters ideas by vote of kind of like a best of category so the public can kind of vote on it. Um, now, of course, this would have to be very secure. Um, so we'd have to kind of tie it into you. We could, for example, imagine like um, you know, Social Security or some sort of blockchain. Um, but the idea is whatever we do this for, we want to make sure that security is primary. And, and that's why I think it's so critical to have it a done by the government and b well funded. So it's I say done by the government, but I, I mean publicly owned and publicly funded. This is an investment in ourselves, right? This is an investment in our in our vehicle to control the direction of our lives. Uh, and that's why I think security and public ownership is so critical. We'd also want to structure it so it's, it's subject to strict transparency regulations and information audits. Uh, and the solution works because it raises overall citizen engagement in our democracy. And I think that's really critical and, and central to the progressive vision. And it provides an easy and convenient access to the information necessary to make an informed decision. So I think one of the big things that a lot of people don't understand is, well, for some of us, it's very easy to get access to very good information, but for others, it's not. There are over 10 states in the United States today where 20% uh, of the population of each of those states do not have access to high-speed internet information, um, which is you know, growing up on the coast. That's that's very a very abstract concept, uh, but it's true. It's also important to recognize, like at this process, that you we have to be inclusive and pluralistic from the start. Um, let's take, for example, the American white working class, which is essentially Trump's core base. Um, the American white working class. The only way we bring them back into the fold is giving them a seat at the table and, and recognizing their concerns and their views. And, and let's be candid, many of them may not be able to express it in a manner that is coherent or makes a strong argument for policy, um, but it's up to those you know, bureaucrats and people, you know, leadership, elected leadership, to do their job and interpret these needs into tangible solutions. Um, at the end of the day, we want to provide easy and convenient access to the information necessary to make an informed decision within society something that it just doesn't exist today. And, and I can actually reinforce that point. Um, I did some nonprofit work. I founded an organization called Our Societies in 2018. It's, it's not really active anymore. 
Um, but we built the first ever free election campaign platform. It's a digital platform um, to give you know, for local elections because they're economically prohibitive for most people. But most important to this point is during that, we, we had a research component during that experiment, and we discovered in New Jersey. So New Jersey is a, a coastal state, very Democrat, very blue, right? Very Democrat, high tech, high wealth. Um, we discovered that in 2018, last year, 77% of the candidates who ran for local office in the state of New Jersey, so anything from mayor or below, posted zero information online about their campaign. So, I mean, in a state like New Jersey that has high access to tech, is, is highly, uh, it has a lot of you know, cash in the state, um, has very good school systems. Even if you wanted to get information on your candidates, you cannot. Uh, and I, I think that's why it's so critical to have some sort of publicly owned information center. We could even argue that this kind of constitutional rethinking um, is a traditionalist method as it was one created by one of the constitutional founders. We're, we're pulling from his argument. So critics of this argument you know, might be in favor of a more traditionalist approach to a rigid constitutional interpretation, but they would really struggle against the hypocrisy of denying one aspect of American history while embracing another as it kind of suits their desires. Um, at the end of the day, again, this was an idea from one of our founding fathers. What excites me most about the concept is from a technical standpoint, it's readily achievable today. We can do it with the appropriate public funding and support. Um, viewing social structures as instruments requiring innovation and improvement is going to become increasingly necessary throughout the United States and really the globe, right? as the exponential trends of technology continue to accelerate. A proactive approach today is a superior solution to a reactive approach when additional crisis occurs in the future. You know, and, and on the note of technology and the shifting of society and how we can use that to our advantage as a democracy, you know, throughout history, technologies have increased access to and, and really to the range of available information um, have fundamentally shifted the legal and moral structures that have governed those societies. So take, for example, 1517, Martin Luther and the 95 Thesis, right? The 95 Thesis that Martin Luther wrote and essentially exposed the hypocrisy and injustice occurring within the church at the time. It was in regards to purchasing forgiveness, uh, essentially that you could, if you were wealthy enough, you could buy forgiveness from the church. And it, it really created, the, the 95 Thesis created a, a really radical split in the Catholic Church, and it really fundamentally shifted European culture. Um, Martin Luther argued that divinity was within every man, that it wasn't the actors, the, the priests and the bishop and the hierarchy in the church. They essentially were arguing before Martin Luther that they were the you know, religious intermediaries, that you needed to go through them for spiritual guidance and, and uh, divinity. Uh, and Martin Luther said, no, it is within every man. Um, and the printing press allowed the translation of the, the Bible from Latin to German, so the average German peasant could read it, uh, which was huge. So we can turn to the United States for another example of how communication technology changed the infrastructure of the country. Uh, think about the Postal Service, right? Postal mail in the United States allowed small firms to coordinate at higher levels giving rise to like a, really a, a new type of, of corporation. Um, then there was the telephone, right, and then the internet. All of these giving rise to instant communication or a higher degree of instant communication. Uh, and then empowering both you know, the mega firms as well as the independent worker who's just working to reach more and access more people for little or, or no additional cost. Yeah, you know, I, I think of my niece. I have a, a niece who's going to be too soon. And you know, she is being, she's born into a world of instantaneous communication on devices that provide literally all the world's information um, in our pockets within seconds. Communication technologies are empowering new generations of people to share ideas and create new visions of what it means to be human. That's, that's just the world that we live in. Uh, and the change shows no sign of slowing down. So it, it's really time to begin discussing how are we going to adapt our legal and institutional structures to meet the needs of a rapidly changing generational consciousness. Um, and uh, my argument, and, and really the, the final argument I'll make in this episode, is that we start with the Constitution. As I argued earlier, it's, it's unjust to bind future generations to the laws and structures of dead men. Now, Jefferson wasn't the only founder who had an opinion on the Constitution and, and how it should be regulated and transformed. Madison, James Madison, was actually not in favor of Jefferson's idea 
of redrafting the Constitution every 19 years. Um, instead, he favored a more rigid structure that would only change when extremely necessary. So really, uh, Madison's idea has really won out in present day. Uh, I would actually propose that both men are correct uh, and that a potential solution to deal with the growing ideological divides propelled by technology would be to have multiple constitutions, right? Not just to have one, but to have many. And before we explore the details of, of what that might look like, we have to establish and, and really recognize together that there is no natural or legal law requiring us to abide by a singular rigid document. A significant challenge when it comes to reimagining the, the legal institutions of the United States is that so much of our population shares this really perplexing dogma about adhering to laws and procedures of the, the distant past. The founding fathers were brilliant men. I'm, I'm not arguing that. I believe that to be true. But I also believe that together we could create something even greater. And as a basis of our legal structure, to reflect modern society and allow it to really reach the potential that it can be unhindered by the you know, dogma of the past. In, in support of Madison, I could get behind the argument that constitutional rigidity is, is positive in regards to fundamental human rights. We could determine these rights through a referendum, reviewing the existing Bill of Rights, um, or we can imagine future rights and then adapt them to modern society, for example, like healthcare. Um, I think every, the majority of people are coming around, to, that should be a right. Um, but I would even go farther, right? Uh, education, uh, information, transportation, communication, um, all of these which help to you know, enhance the human experience and really maximize the potential of, of the individual. If we enshrine rigidity into legal precedents in the sense of these kind of like core rights, we ensure that if a generation of people or peoples were to fall under the spell of a malicious actor, um, not so different than what we have today, that they couldn't impact the fundamental freedoms of those within the age group who don't agree with their views. And I, I think that's really kind of core to this, this point is that we have to recognize that every generation, I'll, I'll define a generation, let's say 15 to 20 years, maybe even less now, maybe 10 years, they all have fundamentally different ways of thinking about the world. And I always joke, when I ran for local office, I talked about um, how you know, I'm one of the first children of the internet. Uh, and I say that because I had you know, dial up internet AOL when I was about 11 years old. Um, and, and there's a radical shift you can see in, in people who are millennials. I think millennial right now is 37 and below. I fall into that category. Um, and, and you know, maybe the, the boomer generation ahead of us or the Gen X really, even the Gen X, um, which is, you know, I find to be a surprising gap, but there's, there's definitely a gap of, you know, when you grow up interconnected with people that you don't know and you make friends beyond race, beyond religion, beyond class. You know, it, it fundamentally alters your perspective of the universe. And, and that's just going to continue to happen, uh, which is why I believe that generational constitutions create a more flexible set of institutional structures really designed to change and adapt to the needs of society. Uh, the basic concept is that citizens within a generation would vote on the legislative and institutional arrangements that best support the maximizing of their generation's potential. So we give them voice in their own direction as a collective. You know, avoiding a potential problem up front, we could limit the operation of the current taxation system. We can say, okay, that might be voted on or that might be subject to constant change, but that's not a generational thing. Uh, and we can limit the generational constitutions to more kind of moral or social things. So for example, things like abortion rights, the right to safety and security, the right to legal and recreational use of marijuana, gun laws. These are things that uh, we can allow for majority votes within generations, um, kind of setting the base that way. And, and we can imagine innovations as taxation as well. You know, we could go deeper into the structural control each generation would have over their destiny, you know, allocating a certain percentage of funds to support projects that they believe in while removing monies from projects they don't. And, and I think that's totally fair. If the present day 18 to 28 year old generation doesn't believe tax dollars should be spent on let's say war, right? Going into another war, they could as a collective vote to remove their tax dollars from that purpose and follow them into something else. Maybe for example, infrastructure or job creation. 
Now, in this scenario, it would also be essential to have a portion of each generation's taxes go to a collective social projects like infrastructure and, and projects with other nations, global stuff. We want to make sure that there is still a collective pool, but allow and allocate a certain amount towards generational projects that are voted on and decided on by that generation. This kind of progressive project assumes that a method for delivery that would be able to provide easy and convenient access to the information necessary for the voters to make informed decisions, just like we talked about earlier, right? A publicly owned information system. Now, generational constitutions may propose some problems, right? Well, for starters, like we know that there are significant ideological conflicts among generations when it comes to specific hot button issues. And we kind of mentioned this earlier. If we compare the support for abortion um, of 50 to 65 year olds compared to 18 to 29 year olds, the 18 to 29 group supports it almost 20% uh, more than the, the older group. So why then should a clear majority of younger people in that demographic that believes abortions fall under an individual's freedom of choice be forced to comply with the moral beliefs of an aging demographic. And I think that's the core conflict is, is we're seeing this more and more and this will only exacerbate as time goes on. Um, many of us who are in our 30s now may live to be 100, 110 with good quality of life thanks to modern medicine. So this is something we need to think about. Further supporting the argument I'm making, you know, we can observe a staggering difference between religious affiliations of the people supporting the illegality of abortions in the United States, and that coincides with a consistent decrease in religious observation among the youth in the United States, which also happens to correlate with the increasing speed and usage of the internet in the United States. Now, this is a single issue we're breaking down, but additional examples uh, exist in, in many different directions. So the question then comes like, how often should we have generations voting on their constitutions? Now, in the past 20 years, we have observed how radically technology can shift society and social norms, right? In, in 1998, we didn't have smartphones. Wi-Fi was not freely, readily available, and solar energy was in its infancy, right? Today, smartphones are used by over a quarter of the Earth's population. Wi-Fi is available in all 50 states, with the lowest percentage of coverage being 91.2% in Alaska. And solar energy is following an exponential growth trend of increasing output while simultaneously decreasing in cost. So considering these facts, 20 years could be a good starting point. But I would personally propose a, a 10 year period due to the exponentially increasing trends in tech, um, because we are essentially destined to create an even quicker pace of change in the not so distant future. I mean, this is a universal constant, but it is more true today than it has ever been. Change is changing and the pace of that change is quickening. So it's about, you know, I think underlying my, my core argument of generational constitutions is the recognition that the laws and structures that were originally coded into the constitution they just simply do not apply to today because the rate of change is so radically different than what it was. Generational constitutions solve the problem of binding future generations to the dogmatic beliefs of the aging, allowing those generations, right, the younger generations, to control their destiny and define their ways of living through a democratic consensus. Now, we, we also need to be sure not to limit this thinking just to ages. It, it could also be a tool for minorities to gain more access to the educational and opportunity things that they need for their future destinies. I mean, this could be chopped up in a lot of different ways. So to wrap it up, you know, this type of legal reformation, generational constitutions, is really vital to reimagining the United States. We want to provide our democracy a method of empowering generations of the future who are now voiceless today. They may not be born yet, or they may be infants or children. We want to give voice to the voiceless to offer perspective. Best of all, this type of project that I'm suggesting revitalizes and empowers the core value that Americans hold so firmly, which is the commitment to a government run by the people for the people.